folks. Um, I hope you had a good coffee break. Let's get started with our next session. I'm Sohit Miglani. I'll be your chair for this session uh, of systems biology. Our first speaker could not be here because of visa issues. Um, so we're going to get started with our second speaker, Daniel Ramirez. Take care away. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Ramirez, and I just finished my first year as a grad student in bioengineering at Northeastern University. Today I'm going to talk about some of my work modeling gene regulatory networks and cell state transitions. So for some quick background, the biological process that we study is called epithelial mesenchymal transition. This is a process where cells lose their cell-to-cell -cell adhesion and acquire a motile migratory phenotype. EMT happens in development, wound healing, and cancer, and some evidence suggests that it's involved in tumor metastasis. From experimental work, we have a pretty good idea of what the transcriptional state of each phenotype in EMT looks like. And we also know a lot about the gene regulatory network controlling it. What we can explain as well is the variability in transition paths with respect to different cell lines and different inducing signals. In particular, some, uh, some signals lead to the acquisition of a hybrid phenotype, uh, and in some cases, cells undergoing EMT exhibit stem cell-like properties. So in this work, we aim to use modeling to understand how different input signals and initial conditions influence the state of the EMT regulatory network. To simulate the GRN, we use an ensemble of ODEs and a software package called Recipe, uh, which is based on a continuous nonlinear model of transcription factor activity, uh, and Recipe generates randomized kinetic parameters and finds a distribution of steady states for the system. So when I refer to a model, you can think of that as a set of parameters for this shared system of ODEs that's uh, embodied in the network. This network was constructed in a previous work based on experimental evidence, and it includes 26 transcription factors, microRNAs, uh, and readout genes. Interestingly, we find that the structure of this network promotes a pretty robust bistability. So kind of regardless of the parameters that you choose, most models will have a steady state solution in the E cluster and in the M cluster. Next thing we wanted to do was simulate a range of perturbations uh, and measure their efficacy in driving the system from the E state to the M state. So we generated these signals by randomly perturbing the network such that E genes would be uh, suppressed and M genes would be activated. To understand how transcriptional noise influences EMT, we also simulated this both deterministically and with uh, transient increase in noise. So to look at some of the high level results that we got from these uh, systematic perturbations, one thing that sticks out is that transcriptional noise uh, significantly increases the efficacy of any signal. Uh, so if you add some stochasticity, you'll get as, as much as 10 times as many models undergoing EMT. Uh, there was also a fairly wide range of effective signals, uh, with some of the top genes having clearly outsized influence, and these genes were coincident with genes that we know to be major regulators of EMT, like TWIST uh, and ZEM, as well as... Uh, uh, we also found that uh, several genes with a smaller out degree or no known regulatory role had a pretty small influence. So this suggests that uh, this ensemble approach is capturing some functional properties of the network decently well. When we added noise, we also found transition times to be roughly exponentially distributed, which is what we expect based on the model design uh, and is broadly in line with experimental findings, which is uh, where some cells may not respond to treatment or some cells may only undergo a partial EMT uh, or may quickly revert. This supports the idea that EMT is inherently a reversible transition and is regulated by both inducing signals and active control of transcriptional noise. Another thing we looked at is whether certain combinatorial signals had strong synergistic effects. Uh, we found a considerable range of synergistic and antagonistic combinations that were broadly correlated with the total out degree of the whole perturbed gene set. At the top of this range, uh, we achieved a higher transition rate than the sum of the individual signal components by almost a factor of two. So to summarize what we found so far, the simulations of this network suggest that EMT is mediated by transient transcriptional noise. We can also use this approach to identify strong EMT-inducing combinatorial perturbations or select perturbations for achieving a desired transition path. Moving forward, I think there's a lot more we can do with this framework. We plan to look deeper into the relationship between input signal and the exact trajectory of the transition. Uh, and we're trying to understand what's a property of the, the model parameters versus what's a property of the network topology. We're also playing around with more physically grounded implementations of transcriptional noise. Uh, and we hope to generalize this to other systems that have sort of more than two states and may have irreversible transitions as well. That's all I have for today. Uh, I'd love to talk more about cell state transitions after the session. I want to thank my advisors. Uh, CTPP and the Pulse Network for bringing us together.
Thank you. Do we ask questions? Can the next speaker also come up? Um, okay, questions. No? All right, well, let's thank our speaker. Our next speaker is Arpita Upadhyay from the University of Maryland. Please take it away. Thank you. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the organizers for having this meeting at this beautiful place. These are a couple of photos I took during my walks over here. Um, so uh, my lab has, uh, at the University of Maryland has been working on cellular dynamics and how cell senses respond to stimuli at different scales. We've uh, worked on immune cell dynamics uh, and in more recent times working on dynamics of transcription factors and gene expression, which I will give you a very brief overview of what we've done in collaboration with Gordon Hager's lab uh, at NIH. So as you know, gene regulation is highly regulated and transcription factors are key players uh, in this process. They bind to specific DNA sequences, turn genes on and off, and they must act in concert with many other proteins for this. So we've been asking several questions related to how transcription factors interact with chromatin, how these are related to gene expression, and how do different stimuli modulate these processes. Um, so a lot of work has been done sort of conventional genomics, with different kinds of sequencing, but these are population level studies to understand accessibility, gene expression, binding, et cetera. But transcription must be responsive to dynamic stimuli. And a number of years ago, um, it was shown that, uh, for example, with the SPRAP study, that there's exchange and recovery that's occurring within tens of seconds, so it's a very dynamic process. So we wanted to understand how these relate to their ability to regulate transcription. So with that, we turn to single molecule imaging. So we can label uh, specific proteins very sparsely. In this case, it's halo tag with a JF dye and then take movies like you saw and then track these dynamics using high-low imaging, that's a thin sheet going through the nucleus. And then from these tracks, we can get information on how, for example, time, how long does the transcription factor uh, stop for when it's binding or how much does it move sort of spatially. And these dynamics carry information about the interactions with chromatin and potentially transcriptional output. So in terms of the time, so we look at bound molecules and kind of look at how long they are bound for before they disappear, either by unbinding or photobleaching. And then we can um, find, uh, basically uh, create survival or dwell time distributions from these time-aligned tracks. And the conventional view is, has been that these TF and chromatin interactions, uh, as given by these dwell time distributions, are bi-exponentially distributed with the short time constants related to non-specific binding and the long time constants related to specific binding. But with some uh, additional image analysis, specifically photo bleaching correction that my student David Garcia implemented, we found, using histones as standard, we found um, that transcription factor dynamics uh, can be characterized by power law um, distributions, and here GR relates to the glucocorticoid receptor, which we've been using steroid hormone receptors as model systems. And this appears to be fairly general. We looked at multiple transcription factors as well as other architectural and binding proteins. Uh, in this case, you just see a couple of other examples showing what appears like power law binding. Um, and these, uh, this distribution suggests sort of a broad affinity, broad binding affinities rather than specific characteristic timescales for specific and non-specific binding. There could be many contributors, the heterogeneity of the landscape, the distribution of motif strengths, and the complex organization and heterogeneity of the nucleus. Uh, what happens when we looked at the spatial dynamics? Um, so again, you know, it's the same kind of uh, movies that we take, but now we do slower imaging, sort of slow SMT, um, um, with uh, intervals of 200 milliseconds, and then we get a number of tracks, uh, and then we can analyze these. So we used a method called PEM, um, where we uh, use this to identify mobility states 
of transcription factors or histones as they're moving around in the nucleus. And I want to point out that we started using this analysis after hearing Simon Mopri's talk in one of the first IPOS meeting I attended, and then we have used that method for immune receptor dynamics and now TF dynamics. So for these bound molecules, we see that they are in two mobility states, so a very low mobility and then a higher mobility. And um, these um, particles also appear to switch between these two mobility states. And then I'm going to move on and say that um, the, t the couple of take-home messages that these the lowest mobility state one appears to correspond to specific binding to chromatin because mutation or removal of the DNA binding domain leads to loss or decrease in the fraction of these lowest mobility states. And then the uh, second low mobility state appears to be at least related to IDR-IDR interactions, but there could be multiple different types of interactions that are responsible sort of for this uh, second low mobility state. <coughs> with that, um, I just wanted to end by saying that we are also starting to work with Suchio Shin and Dave Thrumalai's lab, where their modeling studies have uh, indicated that forces uh, due to transcription might lead to reduced mobility. We're asking, again, these questions that I had pointed out earlier, specifically how do chemical and mechanical cues regulate dynamics and gene expression. <coughs> wanted to thank my lab, collaborators, uh, and funding sources, and thanks for your attention. Um, can the next speaker come up while we're asking questions? Questions, folks. I have a question. Uh, so, uh, I don't need it. Um, so, can you see uh, spatial correlations between the movement of nearby bound transcription factors? So, that's one of the things that we want to do. We look at spatial correlations uh, between those maybe by also looking at the correlations between the dynamics and, let's say, heterochromatin uh, But we haven't been able to do that. Thank you. Oh, just as it's here, it was meant to be a plug for going to APS March meeting and uh, chairing the program committee. I wasn't meaning to do it anyway. You can close my talk. <laughs> All right, our next speaker for the session is Patrick Kelly. Please take it away. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Patrick Kelly. I am a chemical physics PhD student at the University of Maryland. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about some exploring some methods for combining chemical reactions and mesoscale hydrodynamics. Um, so a grand challenge for the 21st century um, is to represent in silico an entire eukaryotic cell with a size of about 10 micrometers, say, over an entire cell cycle, about one day. Um, it's an overwhelming task. There's a huge number of choices for models and the degrees of coarse graining and physical effects you might want to include or exclude. Um, our group has been working on this um, multi-scale simulation uh, platform called Median. It stands for Mechanochemical Dynamics of Active Networks. Um, filaments um, and membranes are modeled as either elastic rods or surfaces with bending and stretching energies. Uh, molecular motors and treadmilling processes move the system stochastically. Um, and concentrations of chemical diffusing species are stored in chemical voxels and populations of chemical species are updated with a variant of the Gillespie algorithm. Um, we exploit uh, timescale separation. Uh, short bursts of chemical reactions are followed by approximately instantaneous um, filament energy min uh, minimization. And we've also, as Nathan talked about uh, yesterday, we're expanding to add Langevin dynamics to it. Um, here's a video of a simulation that we're, of a system that we're studying with um, Mike Merrill's group at Yale. Um, it's a branched ARP23 rich network um, with a myosin motor and actin. 
Um, what we'd really like to do, one of the things we'd like to do is add hydrodynamics and fluid structure interactions. Um, ideally, we'd like to simultaneously solve the equations of motion of fluid, which would be the cytosol in this case, and immerse structures like the cytoskeleton, membranes, or organelles. Um, what we'd really like is a two-way coupling where the structures push on the fluid and the fluid pushes back. Um, we'd use the Navier-Stokes, really the Stokes because we're in a low Reynolds number regime, um, so we'd get rid of the advection term. Um, an even more exciting possibility would be the time-dependent stochastic Stokes equation. That's an idea we're looking into. Um, and we would couple it to the mechanochemical model, like Median. Um, so how do we want to implement the coupling, or what's one way? Um, that would be Peskin's immersed boundary method. Um, these are just the equations from his original paper from 1972 that introduced it. But basically, they're a way of coupling an elastic structure, which is represented, oops, someone, how do I undo that? Where's the full screen? I thought there was a pointer. Yeah, it's, it's a little complicated, but basically there's an immersed structure, which is that filament, and then somehow you have to couple it to the, the surrounding uh, grid, which represents the approximation to the fluid field, and you use it with a sort of regularized direct delta function, which is in there. Um, here's an implementation in Julia of a 2D model of the mitral heart valve. This is um, my implementation of the system Peskin originally studied, just to get a start on this sort of thing. Um, and there are other ideas. There are many ways you could, might think of doing this. Um, another idea we're exploring is Darcy flow. Um, you can derive the Darcy equation for flow through porous media from the Stokes equation. Um, and it solves for the, basically the relative velocity of the cytosol with respect to the actomycin network. Um, unfortunately, this is a one-way fluid structure coupling. Basically, the network drags the fluid around, but the fluid exerts no forces on the network. So the fluid velocity is purely a function um, which updates instantaneously as the, the network changes configuration. We're currently implementing this, and it should be easier to scale and easier to implement than the immersed boundary method, which will be a little trickier. Um, so I want to thank my um, advisors and my group members and our collaborators. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, can the next speaker come up while we ask questions? Um, questions, folks? No? All right, let's thank our speaker once more one more time. Our next speaker is Maria Cristina Canarsa. Please take it away. Okay. Before this becomes a very uh, solitary monologue, can you all hear me? Perfect. Uh, okay, I will talk to you about light driven synchronization of optogenetic clocks. Now, you, okay, you probably all know oscillators in physics and electronics, they're very useful tools to keep track of the passing of time. Uh, but they can do the same in biological processes. I'm afraid you can't see them doing it in embryonic development, uh, but you all experience the next example, which is the circadian <laughs> rhythm, uh, which probably gave jet lag to several of you, of you coming here. And it's a sleep-wake cycle we all experience every day. Uh, now, all these biological examples are very complex. You can spend lifetimes trying to study them, um, an alternative approach to try to understand something about biological oscillators is to, is to start building a very simple oscillator from scratch and then gradually build complexity over that. And this is exactly what has, what has been done with the repressilator. It's one of the milestones in the field of synthetic biology and it is very simple, very simple okay, um, network made of three proteins. Each of the proteins represses one of the others. You can see, for example, the, okay, the red protein 
is repressing the blue protein, as indicated by this symbol. And this means that when the red protein is present, the blue protein can't be produced anymore. There is some, sort, some delay in this repression. So the overall behavior of these circuits, if you put them in a single bacterium, is this one. You can see here there is time, here there is protein, concentra okay, sorry, protein concentration, and you can see this oscillatory pattern in gene expression. Uh, you can describe this system using simple differential equations. Um, here they're all made symmetrical, they're all uh, made the same, so that it's easier to understand. Each of the equations represents the change in concentration in one of the proteins. So for example, uh, protein X is, uh, the production of protein X is, is regulated by Z, which is on the denominator, and the uh, uh, decrease in X is regulated by the dilution caused by the growth rate. Uh, now, this all works very well in a single bacterium, but more often than not, you have multiple bacteria, and so we'll have a, a distribution of parameters. Uh, in particular, there is the growth rate that can be very different even inside a single population of bacteria, and this variability in parameters cause the oscillators to all have slightly different timing. We can see the result of this here. Each of the axes represents the concentration of one of the proteins. The little balls are uh, the position of bacteria in this concentration space. And you can see that even if they are forced to all start at the same point, they will gradually lose synchronization over time due to these different in oscillations. Now you can see that all the oscillators keep oscillating, uh, but if you look at the average of the population on the on the, on the, oops, on the bottom, spoiler, uh, on the bottom, uh, the average of the population uh, loses synchronization over time until it eventually becomes an, an almost flat line. Now, this is a simulation, but you, you can also see it in an experimental data here. So we ask ourselves, um, can we control these independent genetic oscillators using light? And the reason to use light for this is that it's a very versatile tool for uh, research and applications because you can control precisely uh, the space, uh, control it precisely in space and time. Um, our proposed uh, approach to this is represented here. We are basically adding an optogenetic module that regulates the production of a second copy of the red protein. The way this module works is shown here with red light. There is the sensor, which is this protein, which is turned off. So the whole chain of signaling is turned off and there is no production from this promoter. While with green light, the sensor is turned on and this eventually makes this promoter active and more red protein is produced. Now the intended behavior of this circuit is that with red light, the system oscillates as usual, while with green light, we force the system to a fixed state in which the blue protein is turned off and only the yellow protein is visible. Okay. This is the mathematical implementation of our system. Uh, we are basically adding, uh, okay. we are basically adding uh, another equation for X prime, which is the, uh, red, uh, for the red protein which is just regulated by light, and it's just the same as X in regulating uh, the Y protein. Now again, this was our expected behavior. Uh, what we got at the first try was this, which is uh, a bit depressing as a PhD student. Uh, so it turns out we forgot this parameter, which is the promoter leakage, meaning that even in ideally complete repression, there is still a certain level of protein production. And the leakage means that the limit cycle of the oscillator gets first um, decreased and then eventually broken, as you can see in this case. Uh, now, the obvious thing to do here is to decrease lambda. Uh, it's very not obvious how to do that from the molecular perspective. So we kind of worked around this. We can rewrite our equation like this and what we basically do, have done is to decrease the whole transcription and translation efficiency 
of the gene. I'm not gonna enter into detail on this. If you want, we can discuss later. Uh, we basically tried different ranges of gene expression that you can see here uh, with gradual decrease in the level of gene expression until we eventually managed to make a system which could oscillate in a way that was comparable to our control, and we call this system the opto-repressilator. Now, we, we show that this system can oscillate. We have to show if it can actually be synchronized using light. We use two kinds of experiments for this. The first is to look at uh, a population of bacteria grown in liquid cultures. We used 96 well plates for this and uh, a little device made like this so, we, so we can uh, send specific inputs to different wells of the plate. Uh, you can see one of the experiments here. Uh, there is the blue protein concentration on this axis. The dark line is the repressilator. The blue line is our system. They are flat at the beginning because they are not synchronized. Then we send light on the sample. Our system responds to it. Then we remove the light. And you can see that the sample is now synchronized and there are detectable oscillations in the population. Uh, the other experiment we did was using modern machine, which is focused on the behavior of individual cells. You basically have a single cell stuck in a fixed position in space for long periods of time and in constant growth conditions. Uh, you can see in the video, the channels are not synchronized at the beginning. Then we send light, gene expression is turned off, remove the light, and the sample is much more synchronized than it was before. Okay, uh, we were very pleased by this, of course. Um, then we went further for, with analysis. So for example, you can notice that uh, over time, as expected, the sample loses synchronization again. So we asked uh, ourselves, can we keep the sample synchronized for longer? Use, okay, we use um, trains of shorter light inputs. You can see a video on top, and here the tracks from the same experiment. The blue line is the average behavior of the population. You can see it's following the inputs very well and it, and it's, it stays synchronized for longer time periods, which we, again, we were happy about. Um, then we started analyzing the behavior of the individual oscillators in this plot. You can see two of them highlighted here. And I mean, you can see the, like they're both following the oscillations, but they're doing it in, in very different ways. So for example, the dark oscillator is very slow at the beginning, and then it always receives the light input on the peaks of gene expression, while the other oscillator is very fast at the beginning, makes two oscillations, and then it always receives the light inputs on the valley between the gene expression peaks. To understand this, we turn to computational simulations. So you can imagine an oscillator which is going at its own native frequency. And what we notice is that if you send a light input on what would have been a peak of gene expression, the peak gets like, killed. And then the next oscillation is uh, anticipated over time respect to when it would have been. While if you send a light input in the valley between two peaks, the next oscillation is delayed over time respect to when it would have been. You can quantify this behavior using a phase response curve, like shown here, where we have the phase shift over the pulse arrival time. And this can help us understand the experimental data from before, which are already here, yes, okay. Uh, so, uh, for example, the, um, the dark oscillator, which was low, uh, is getting anticipated every time by receiving the inputs on the peaks of gene expression, while the fast oscillator is getting delayed every time by receiving the inputs on the valleys of gene expression. And both of these mechanisms are contributing to keep the population synchronized over time. Uh, finally, uh, you already know that oscillators have their own native frequencies. Uh, here we're interested in the mean native frequency. 
And so far, when we send live inputs to the sample, we always use the first in frequency, which is the same as the mean native frequency. Of course, you can also um, decrease the first in frequency or increase the first in frequency. All of these experimental conditions can be put on an axis, and this axis becomes the x-axis on this plot. On the y-axis, there is the ratio between the actual population frequency and the uh, first in frequency. So for example, this big blue plateau here at value one means that there is this large interval in frequencies for which there is always one oscillation in the population per one light input, okay? So the ratio is one. Then there are jumps in this plot. Like here, it goes at two, which means there are two oscillations in the population <coughs> per one light input. And then it jumps below, here at 0 0.5, meaning that there is one oscillation in the population every two light inputs. Now, this is clearly a simulation. Uh, so we made uh, experiments to validate it. Uh, these are results from um, uh, bulk population experiments. And you can see, starting from the top, that the experiments are following very well the expected behavior. So uh, at the beginning, there are two oscillations of the population for each input. So the ratio is two, as expected. Then there is the uh, blue plateau over one. Uh, with one oscillation of the population for every input, then uh, apparently, no matter how much you increase the frequency, you always see the ratio staying at one, which was uh, a bit puzzling. Uh, so we did more experiments, um, particularly with another mother machine experiment, in which we observed the, uh, that the individual oscillators were actually oscillating at half the frequency, uh, half of the first in frequency. You see they're like doing one oscillations and then another one here, but different channels are set on different trains of the inputs. So it's just that if you average it, you get the impression that the ratio is one, but it's actually one, uh, 0 0.5 as expected from the simulations. Um, now there is a um, preprint, a uh, reviewed preprint of this paper, which will hopefully grow up to be a full paper uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, my group. In particular, I highlighted the people that have the most. I want to thank in particular Giacomo, which you saw doing an amazing presentation on Monday, and my PI, Roberto Di Leonardo. Then the organizers for making this conference possible, and all of you for your attention. Thank you, Maria. That was fantastic. Um, can the next speaker come up while we ask questions? Yes. This is, this is a great question, actually. So the uh, representative circuit is on a low copy plasmid. So it's supposed to be around like from 10 to five copies in the genome. The, uh, we had to move the, the concert we made. Uh, sorry, sorry, it's, uh, okay, the, the representative is on a plasmid. Our uh, additional gene is on the genome to reduce its copy number in way to decrease the final leakage. I don't know if I replied to your question or, uh, or no. Okay. All right, more questions. Bob, over there. Sorry, I didn't understand it. Okay. You, in theory, could do it, yes. And that way you will have the whole population self-synchronized without you needing to do input. Yeah. I, uh, we actually had looked at it, but the light out of the, out of the luciferase was very, very low value, so I'm not sure it could work, but it's a nice idea in theory, yes. 
More questions. Yes, over there. Uh, another great question. So the, um, it's, the period is really dependent on the growth rate. So yes, it's, uh, I mean, I don't know the exact ratio, but it's uh, it, like if you make a bacteria grow faster, you see the period gets in faster because the, the, like the limiting step is the dilution caused by growth. So if bacteria grow more, the period gets faster. Uh, is this okay? Any more questions? All good? All right, well, thank you, Maria. That was fantastic. All right, our next speaker is Jonathan Fiorentino. Take it away. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, today I will present to you my recent work about the prediction of protein RNA interactions from single cell transcriptomic data. RNA binding proteins are a crucial regulator of uh, gene expression, uh, being involved in many steps uh, of uh, RNA uh, processing. Uh, they act by binding both uh, coding and non-coding RNAs through RNA binding domains, uh, and they uh, control gene expression both uh, in uh, physiology and pathological conditions such as uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, experimental techniques based on cross-linking and immunoprecipitation followed by sequencing uh, provided a large catalog of uh, protein RNA interactions. However, uh, they are limited to a few uh, cell lines and uh, uh, only interactions for hundreds of RNA binding proteins have been uh, measured, but we know that uh, there are uh, thousands of RNA binding proteins uh, in, uh, in many organisms uh, at present. Uh, they, also have, uh, they also are affected by several detection limits. Uh, uh, finally, uh, recently uh, there has been evidence uh, of uh, cell type specific uh, uh, RNA uh, protein interactions. So there is a need for computational methods uh, to predict um, uh, RNA protein interactions at uh, uh, cell type level. Uh, previous work from our lab has shown that uh, there is an association between uh, the interaction propensity of an RNA binding protein to its target RNA um, uh, uh, with a correlation between their expression levels. And this was shown by computational analysis uh, on bulk RNA-seq data from uh, human cell lines. Uh, moreover, uh, other work, another work from our lab has shown that uh, uh, RNA and protein levels are highly correlated for RNA binding proteins. Uh, and they have a large number of interactions, uh, such as uh, transcription factors. Um, in my work, I use uh, single cell RNA sequencing data. Uh, this is an experimental technique that provides the expression level of tens of thousands of genes in hundreds to up to millions uh, of cells, uh, starting from a, a sample of a tissue uh, or an organ. Uh, in the last decade, it provided uh, an unprecedented resolution of the uh, cell type and subtype composition of many organs and tissues in different, in different organisms. Uh, beyond the identification of new uh, cell types and subtypes, uh, there has been a large focus on uh, the inference of gene regulatory networks from this kind of data. Uh, but the focus so far has been uh, only on transcriptional regulation. So, uh, several statistical and machine learning methods have been developed uh, to infer transcription factor target interactions uh, from single cell RNA seq data. In my work, uh, I introduced a, a new computational pipeline called SC Rapid, um, uh, which uh, uh, integrates uh, gene regulatory network inference methods uh, um, uh, on single cell RNA seq data uh, with predictions made with CatRapid. Uh, which is an algorithm previously developed uh, in our lab that can uh, estimate the interaction propensity uh, of protein RNA pairs uh, starting from their sequences, so it's not based on expression. Uh, and by integrating these methods, uh, I will show you how we are able to infer um, uh, protein RNA interactions from, uh, from single cell RNA-seq. Um, so I will not describe all the uh, analysis that we can do with this pipeline, uh, but here in the, in the uh, scheme, there is an overview uh, uh, of the 
uh, steps that we, uh, that we propose. Um, I base the choice of the ground truth interactions on the ENCODE project since uh, uh, it uh, includes uh, uh, chipsec uh, uh, data, uh, which I use uh, uh, as ground truth interactions for the uh, transcription factor target, uh, eclip data for uh, direct uh, RNA binding protein target interactions, uh, and uh, it also contains uh, uh, short terpene RNA followed by sequencing uh, data, which I, I will show you how uh, we use them um, uh, to uh, quantify indirect uh, protein RNA interactions. Uh, I selected uh, several single cell RNA seq data set uh, for the same human cell lines from the ENCODE uh, project uh, uh, coming from different sequencing protocols. And finally, I uh, selected six different uh, uh, gene regulatory network inference methods, uh, which are the state of the art methods, and they are based on different uh, theories uh, and uh, uh, statistical models. First of all, I uh, benchmarked the uh, uh, possibility of inferring protein RNA interactions against the classical task, which is the inference of transcription factor target interactions. To evaluate the performances, I use the early precision ratio, uh, which is defined as the fraction of true positives uh, in the top key edges of the network, uh, where key is the number of edges in the ground truth network, uh, divided by the density of the ground truth network, which it can be shown to uh, quantify uh, the performance that a random predictor uh, would have. Uh, in, the, in the figure, I show the probability density of the early precision ratio uh, on all the data sets and uh, uh, inference algorithms aggregated. Uh, for the transcription factor target in blue and uh, RBP target interactions uh, in uh, uh, purple. What you can see is that uh, for transcription factor target, the performance is slightly better uh, than those achieved by a random predictor, which is depicted by the black uh, line. Uh, while uh, there is a, a significant uh, uh, improvement in the case of uh, RNA binding protein target interactions. Uh, next, uh, we thought that a way to improve the performances in the prediction of this kind of interactions uh, would be the integration with a complementary information uh, not coming from the expression. For this reason, uh, we use CatRapid, which is the method that I mentioned before uh, from our lab, to prune edges from the uh, inferred protein RNA regulatory network uh, with the hope of eliminating indirect uh, interactions. Um, basically, we studied how the early precision ratio varies uh, as a function on the CatRapid score, uh, and we set a threshold at a certain value uh, based on all the uh, data sets that we selected. Uh, we filtered out uh, interactions uh, with a score uh, smaller uh, than our threshold, uh, and then uh, we computed the relative difference uh, in early precision ratio um, after and uh, before the filtering uh, using CatRapid. In the heat map, you see the single cell RNA seq data sets in the rows uh, with some uh, uh, statistics of the ground truth networks uh, and the gene regulatory network inference methods uh, in the columns. Uh, the values uh, uh, in the cells show uh, the early precision ratio after the filtering. And uh, in parentheses, I show the relative difference in early precision ratio. Uh, you, you can see that it's uh, uh, almost always positive, and on average, uh, we obtain an improvement in the performance around the 20%. Um, from previous studies about uh, uh, gene regulatory networks uh, in the context of transcription factor target interactions, uh, it's known uh, that they are uh, heavily affected by uh, false positives, which are usually uh, indirect interactions. Uh, in our case, so in the context of protein RNA interactions, we can uh, directly test uh, uh, this uh, issue uh, using the uh, short terpene RNA uh, data, uh, in which basically, basically a small RNA is, is used to knock down the expression of an RNA binding protein, and then the bulk population is sequenced to identify upregulated and downregulated uh, target RNAs. So it can provide both direct and in indirect interactions. Uh, basically, we removed uh, direct eclip interactions from the short terpene uh, RNA data uh, in order to obtain indirect protein RNA interactions. And then uh, we evaluated the performances of the algorithms before and after the catrapid based uh, filter. Uh, in the figure on the left, uh, I showed the probability density of the early precision ratio in the, in the case of direct interactions. And you can observe that the 
um, uh, green distribution, which is the one obtained after the filter uh, shifts the uh, early precision ratio toward higher values, so the filtering improves uh, the performance, while in the case of indirect interactions, we have the opposite effect. Uh, so basically, um, the filtering with CatRapid, uh, it's actually removing indirect interactions. Uh, as a final result, I will show you that uh, um, uh, basically we can predict also protein-protein uh, interactions from this kind of networks uh, because we know that uh, RNA binding proteins uh, rarely act uh, in isolation in the cells, but they uh, are uh, often acting in uh, macromolecular complexes uh, and they often involve several uh, RNA binding proteins that uh, interact with, uh, with RNAs. So uh, it's crucial to uh, identify um, interactions also at the protein level between uh, RNA binding proteins. Uh, so we thought that uh, we could identify this kind of interactions uh, based on the shared uh, RNA targets between RNA binding proteins. So the idea is that if two RNA binding proteins uh, control uh, the same set or a similar set of targets, it's uh, also likely that they have a direct uh, interaction at the protein level. Uh, in this case, uh, we used as uh, ground truth interactions the uh, Bioplex Interactom database, which contains uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of protein-protein interactions uh, identified uh, uh, via affinity pur purification mass spectrometry. And uh, it also contains uh, thousands of uh, uh, interactions uh, between RNA binding proteins. Uh, we selected single cell RNA seq datasets from the same human cell lines, uh, and then we ranked uh, the pairs of RNA binding proteins uh, according to the Jacquard coefficients, coefficient between their target RNAs uh, obtained from the inferred networks. Uh, next, we uh, performed a gene set arrangement analysis considering the Bioplex interactions as ground truth. Uh, and uh, you can see in the plot on the left that we uh, obtained st a strongly significant enrichment for uh, several uh, gene regulatory network inference methods, in particular uh, GRN Boost 2, uh, for which I also show uh, the enrichment plot on the right, uh, in which you can see uh, that uh, there is a, um, an enrichment for these Bioplex interactions uh, uh, in the, in the um, uh, top uh, ranking uh, inter predicted in the interactions. So to conclude, uh, with this work we established the uh, prediction of protein RNA interactions from uh, single cell transcriptomic data by integrating existing uh, gene regulatory network inference methods with the uh, uh, CatRapid predictions. Uh, I didn't show that we can also uh, uh, accurately predict uh, interactions with long non-coding RNAs uh, especially with uh, uh, the newest uh, full-length uh, sequencing protocols. Um, I also didn't show that we can uh, predict uh, hub RNA binding proteins and uh, uh, hub uh, uh, RNAs intended as, as RNAs that are strongly regulated by many uh, RNA binding proteins. Uh, and finally, that uh, um, uh, we can also uh, predict RBP co-interactions from this kind of, of network. Uh, and this also gives room to, uh, to several um, uh, improvements uh, of this uh, kind of predictions, for instance, uh, toward the identification of uh, protein complexes uh, from this kind of network. If you are interested in the details, there are these uh, two works that are out. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank especially Alex Armas, uh, Alessio Colantoni, and Gian Gaetano Tartaglia. Uh, for this work and uh, all the lab uh, and uh, all of you for your attention. Thank you. Then, um, can the next speaker come up while we ask questions? Um, yes, over there.
different, uh, but uh, uh, so actually this uh, uh, so this threshold was already used uh, in several previous studies uh, from our lab, so uh, it was it was kind of already independently validated. You know. Any other questions? All right, let's thank our speaker. I just uploaded it to the... Um... All right, let's welcome our speaker, Simon Mockery. Hi. <coughs> um, uh, let me just thank the organizers for organizing a conference in this wonderful location. Um, what I'm going to tell you about is uh, a little story about uh, loop extrusion and how uh, the loop extrusion model can be extended uh, across the tree of life. Um, so uh, at uh, genomic scales between maybe 10 kilobases and maybe a million kilobases, uh, chromatin configuration capture experiments have revealed a pattern of over overlapping squares in the probability that uh, two places on the genome come into contact uh, that are shown in these, uh, these, uh, these figures here. You can sort of see these squares. The, the diagonal corresponds to the same genomic location, and deviations from the diagonal correspond to locations, different genomic locations. Um, and um, the, there's, a, there's a very uh, powerful and popular model that's been used to account for those data called the loop extrusion factor model. And uh, the key elements of that model are shown in this cartoon here, there are uh, condensin molecules which uh, bind to uh, chromatin. And uh, when they bind, they start to extrude a loop of, chrom of chromatin, as you, as you see at the, uh, where I wrote loop extrusion with a, uh, underneath it. Um, loop extrusion continues uh, until either one of those cohesin molecules uh, contacts a neighboring cohesin molecule, another cohesin molecule, in which case they're presumed to block each other, or until it uh, impacts, comes into contact with, hits uh, uh, another molecule called CTCF, uh, which binds specifically to particular sites on DNA. And so CTCF, the locations of CTCF binding sites, establishes those uh, patterns of squares that I showed you previously is the idea. And this, this does a, a pretty reasonable job. Uh, on the top, you see uh, a simulation uh, based on this model. And on, and on the bottom, you see the experiment. I'm afraid I, I rotated the, uh, the figure through 45 degrees. Uh, well, it wasn't me. This was uh, Fuddenberg and, and, and his group. But I'm, I'm going to show things right. But, but there's a big problem with this model, which is that uh, CD, the CTCF model is only predictive in vertebrates. Uh, beyond vertebrates, uh, CTCF is either not exist, there's no ortholog of CTCF in, in most of the tree of life, uh, or uh, CTCF behaves differently uh, in, in, uh, outside of vertebrates. Uh, okay, so uh, this, is, this, is, this is a little piece of the tree of life. You can see the vertebrate branch. Uh, if I show you the entire tree of life, 
uh, vertebrates is just a little teeny twig over there. So uh, this is to convince you that what I'm telling you is important. Uh, you know, it's 95% uh, of species are not vertebrates, I guess. I just made up 95%. It could be more than that. Um, okay, so, so what do we do? So, so the idea is that um, loop extrusion uh, occurs, uh, uh, is driven by uh, cohesin. So what we do is we write down a master equation for uh, the cohesin occupancy of a, of a particular site. And uh, so uh, cohesin can flow into that site, it can flow out of that site along the chromatin. That, that would be loop extrusion, or it can uh, uh, absorb, it can associate, or it can, or it can dissociate. Uh, what we do is we uh, assume that association, the association currents and the dissociation currents are small compared to the flows in and out of the site. And if you do that, then of course the current of cohesin is conserved and then you can use that to relate the occupancy probability at a particular uh, chromatin site with the rate at which cohesin flows in and out of that site. That's essentially what we do. And so now we, we, we find a bunch of site-dependent rates uh, that don't depend on any particular so-called boundary element, don't depend on knowing what CTCF uh, molecule uh, is in, for example, yeast, which does not have any CTCF. Anyway, then we do the same as uh, was done previously. We carry out a Gillespie simulation. We calculate the resultant simulated high C maps, and we optimize parameters to uh, obtain agreement with the experimental maps. Oops, uh, let's see, did that work? Oh, yeah. And this just shows you uh, agreement in uh, uh, fission yeast, for example. Uh, I've, I've done it again, I've, I've rotated through, night, through 45 degrees, but this time the other way. Uh, and what you can see is on the, uh, let's see, I have to get this right, on, on, on your uh, left you see the simulation, and then on the right you see uh, experiment, and you can see there's good agreement. Uh, this is in Palm B. I'm running out of time. Yes, uh, I'm nearly done. Uh, this is in um, my, my, myotic budding yeast. Notice that the, the high C pattern is very different, but we still get good agreement. Uh, this is in uh, mitotic budding yeast. Uh, again, the high C map is very different. The experimental high C map is very noisy. Um, and uh, it also works in vertebrates. Um, and then uh, a message from our sponsors, let me shamelessly promote my book. Um, if you go to the Springer site now from ICTP, you can get a free copy. It's a joke, you guys should laugh. <laughs> it's true though. Oh. I don't know what that that was going. That was my that was in case there was a question. I've seen that one. I was gonna buy it. It's great. <laughs> it's but you can get it now for free. Done. For the sake of time, if you don't mind, we'll skip questions. Uh, you can approach Simon if you have questions later. Um, can our next speaker come up, please? Our next speaker is Andrea Falcon Cortez. Please take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrea Falcon. I'm a postdoc fellow at the DiPiero Lab in Northeastern University. So let's start. Uh, we already know that multiple sequence alignments teach us about evolution since it allows us to detect sounds of covariation and conservations, uh, inferring functional interactions in proteins. If we want to do the same thing, but at the level of genomes, we face the problem of multiple genome alignments, which is uh, 
still very challenging uh, for so many reasons. Uh, we have a lot of data. The genome goes through different uh, modifications as inversions, translocations, and duplications. And also, inside the genome, we have different mutation rates for introns and exons. So we propose a synteny-based approach for large-scale multiple genome alignments uh, at the level of homologous genes. So, for example, if we have these two mammal genomes, one for giraffe and what is the pointer? Oh, yeah. One for giraffe and another gen genome for cheetah, each dot in this map uh, correspond to an homology relationship between two genes. So this gene in giraffe has three different homologous genes in cheetah, okay? If we complete this homology map, we can see uh, patterns, for example, these diagonals that you can distinguish here and here. These diagonals are genes that besides to be homologous, they also preserve their physical position in both genomes. It means they are synthetic. Uh, that say to us that this piece of DNA is the same as this piece of DNA, and this piece of DNA is the same as this piece of DNA. Also, we can see that these two genes, yeah, these two genes in cheetah uh, are duplicated in the genome of giraffe. Now, this is the real homology map for the whole genome of giraffe and cheetah. And the goal now is to find every conserved zone in this homology map. Uh, for this, we use, uh, we find these conserved regions or these synthetic regions using our own algorithm, Dan Chainer, uh, developed by our colleague, Alex Moffett, and highlighted in red here in the homologous map, you can see all the synthetic regions found by this algorithm. And this method also allows us to make some mathematical tests. Uh, for example, we can uh, find that the probability of a false positive for synthetic regions of size three is, is, almost, is almost zero. Um, now, uh, the next step is that we apply this method to compare 200 mammal genomes. It means we have almost 20,000 homology maps. Uh, here you can see a couple of examples for the homology maps. This is for human and mouse, and this is for whale and koala. If we uh, take all the information obtained for these comparisons, we can embed this information into a network which communities uh, may give us uh, multiple sequence, no, sorry, multiple genome alignment for all the coding genes in, uh, in the whole genome uh, for mammals. And well, of course, this is an ongoing work, but we have found very interesting results that we are eager to publish them and share with you. So uh, stay tuned. Um, Thanks for your attention. Muchas gracias. Andrea, um, can the next speaker come up while we ask questions? Questions, folks. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, well, let's thank our speaker one more time. All right, our next speaker is Mariano Barbieri. Please take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Mariano Barbieri. I'm based in Gettinga, 
in this, this is the topology in this really oh God. now better yes so i'm Göttingen <laughs> in this in this is the pathology and today i'm going to talk to you about protein protein and protein chromatin interactions and okay not easy actually <laughs> don't realize it. Um, so yeah, I don't think I have to explain you how transcription works for DNA and it is in the, it is in the nucleus and, uh, and probably you know that the DNA in the nucleus is not like a spaghetti dish, but it's something more complicated in which the chromosomes uh, occupy separate territories, but much more complicated than that. If you go within chromosomes, you see structures all the way uh, uh, through the scales to the, to, the cro to the single DNA helix. And so this is basically the topic of my, uh, of my research, understanding how uh, these this structures are formed. And uh, also because uh, it, we also know that the structure is, co is correlated with the, with the functions or with the genetic expression. And so things, different regulatory elements needs to come close to, to genes uh, in order to be properly activated or repressed. And, uh, and this happens usually through protein interaction, chromatin-protein interaction and protein-protein interaction. And uh, so since this task looks uh, pretty difficult if you want to really go into the, all these scales in here, uh, then we need, let's say, to uh, neglect a lot of the atomistic details of, our, of the system. So the building block, of, uh, building block of our system for the DNA, for instance, is what is called the, the chromatin fiber, in which you see DNA wrapped around these proteins that are called histones, and uh, forming this structure that is believed to, to be like a fiber. And, uh, and the way we addressed it since 2012 with Mario Nicodemi was like a bead on a string polymer representing the, the chromatin with proteins floating around and with specific rules of interaction between, between them. And uh, what about protein? So if you look at protein, since we have to neglect a lot of these atomistic details, so um, everyone have a very uh, top-down approach, let's, let's say. Um, we um, roughly divide the interaction of, of, of the protein or interest in two categories. A multivalent interaction that is uh, located in the protein intrinsically disordered domain uh, that we know that's associated to multivalent interaction with other proteins, for instance. Uh, as you can see, for instance, uh, is very much not really ordered. Domain. While another, other regions of the same protein, like this is CTCF, as you have maybe heard of it in the previous talk, for instance, in another, another speaker before. Uh, it's more like, uh, forms more like specific uh, uh, bounds to, to DNA, uh, exclusive, uh, sequence specific and exclusive bound. Um, so this will allow us to have, okay, if you see, if you look at this, uh, at the CTCF in particular, this is CTCF, so here you have the, what is called the intrinsically disordered, the disorder score, in the, the IDR score, basically. And when, it, when, you, when you see low values, this gives you, this tells you that basically this is a very ordered uh, protein, uh, protein. And in the case of CDCF, this corresponds to what is called zinc, zinc fingers domains that um, selectively recognize specific sequence of the DNA to which the protein has to, to, to attach. And keep this in mind because later will be important. And so this is nice because with this system we can, uh, you know, investigate a lot of biological questions uh, of interest for molecular biology. Like, uh, is there a, tra a transcription uh, uh, factory, let's call it that way, in which all the, 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 the proteins involved in transcription that are called RNA pole 2, this green stuff there, are actually uh, get together, forming a kind of a mi microphase separated object. Or also, in the, there are these nuclear speckles, but nobody really knows they are formed by, by other proteins like SRM2 or SARM2. Um, and nobody really knows which kind of interaction and which kind of structure is, is there. We just see them as a big blob or something like that. Um, at the same time, we can study the, the interaction with chromatin, the specific binding, 
uh, of CTCS in this case, but of any other protein. And also, we can use the same platform uh, to investigate active processes of interest uh, happening on the, on, the, on the chromatin fiber, like, for instance, transcription, of course, RNA pol 2 attached to the gene and goes through the gene. Uh, but also, as one of the speakers before was mentioning, another process that is called loop extrusion that is believed to be very important for chromatin folding, although it's not really clear to what extent it's important for ex expression. Uh, so we, we have this, basically I have all these ingredients in my, in, in my model and uh, one nice thing uh, that we have, uh, because it seems like an impossible task, but one nice thing that we have is actually uh, contact probability data of the whole genome. So basically we have from the experiment a quantity that is, is a proxy for how close to um, let's say gen generic sequences of the, of the genome are in space. Uh, this this quantity here, and uh, and this is a real experiment from the lab of Akis Pamantonis, with which I collaborate, and um, and so basically uh, um, we did the simulation for this uh, here. Um, just uh, a little bit of notation because basically this, this, uh, these guys here in red and in, in, in black are the binding sites of, an, of, uh, of CTCF and of RNA pol 2 and, uh, and these are the simulation that uh, gives you the, the contraproductive matrices and also the, but now we can access to other many uh, qu quantities that are not accessible in the experiment like the cohesin flow for instance. So the biological question was what happens if cohesin meets RNA pol 2 along the way? Do they uh, interact each other? Do they impede each other? What, what's the relationship? And the answer is actually yes. So what they observe in the experiment is that by removing RNA pol 2, uh, the loops that they see uh, are much longer. Oh, I forgot to say that, as, uh, that CTCF stops cohesing by extrusion, extrude, to extrude. So basically, the loops that you see is cohesing that is basically stalled between two uh, CTCF proteins. If you, if you remove RNA pol 2, you see longer loops. So this demonstrated, and also demonstrated that also that um, RNA pol 2 is is, uh, is let's say uh, interacting with cohesin in some way that uh, the, it slows down the, the loop extrusion process, and also the cohesin flow so along the fiber totally changes and becomes totally different. So the whole dynamic of loop extrusion is influenced by RNA pol 2 in a way that it is not, not yet clear. And next question, oh, okay, and then you can see also genome-wide, this is a specific lo locus, but this is genome-wide in which you see that the length of the CCTF, CTCF anchor loops increases if you remove RNA pol 2. So um, the next question would be, what about we remove CTCF, what happens? Uh, this is a project that we have with, uh, with uh, Marike Odelar in, in Göttingen, but I, don't, I won't tell you the question because I don't have time. So uh, I want to go to the next part, but if you are interested, let come to me later and I will, give, I will tell you the results of, the, of this quest. But what I wanted to actually tell you is about um, phase separation in senescence. So basically, the, the normal uh, wild-type cells um, in the proliferative state, proliferative state they, they, they replicate, but uh, when they enter in the senescent state, <coughs> the, repl the replicative senescent state, um, um, they of course, the replicative senescent state, so they start, they start to replicate less and less and go into a quiescent state. Um, what they observe in the lab of Aki Slapantoni is that upon the senescent, so this is the normal case in which you see cells, a nucleus with this CTCF protein again, and this other protein that is called the HNGB2 uh, that is believed to be important in senescence. So what they observed is that upon senescence, CTCF clusters form these clusters. And this protein, HNGB2, disappears. And what they did, they removed this protein, HNGB2, in proliferative cells, and they could recapitulate the same phenotype. Uh, so they see again the formation of CTCF. CTCF cluster. So, and this is the, this, this will be the parameter, the parameter of interest. So like, in th this gives you how many cells show the presence of uh, senescence in those uh, CTCF cluster, this siege, uh, let's say, nomenclature. So basically, you can see that going from proliferative to senescent state, you have to basically go, go to zero to 100% of clusters. 
Um, so this is nice. Uh, another, uh, uh, so basically we tried to put together all the ingredients to make a model. And so another ingredient was that you could see that uh, this cluster of CTCF were actually co-localizing with the cluster of SARN2, this other protein nuclear speckles that I was telling you about, telling you about before. Uh, so there seems to be a, a kind of an, an interaction between the two, an affinity. Uh, so in the model, we also uh, looked at the IDR score of the, all the three proteins, and we realized that all the three of them has uh, prominent regions with uh, an IDR, an, an elevator, let's say, a higher number of IDR score. So we gave them all a pro the propensity to phase separate, uh, to self-interact. So different proteins of the same type, they can interact with each other. And at the same time, from OIP, MASPEC, they realized that there is an interaction between SRN2 and CDCF and between HNGP2 as SRN2, uh, but not between CDCF and HNGP2. So the idea was that, that if you remove HNGP2, you are changing, let's call it the uh, normal protein network, so that the interaction that was, so there was a competition mechanism between CTCF and HNGB2 for the interaction with SARM2. And if you removed HNGB2 from the picture, then this interaction becomes much, becomes much stronger, and then you get the CTCF clustering formation. So we introduced this uh, into the model, and basically from, these are the experimental data on the top, and on the, on the bottom there is the, 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 the simulation in which you have plus minus HNGP2, left and right, and you could actually see that the cluster fraction uh, of, of, uh, of CTCF, so how, like how many CTCF are in a cluster, uh, increases uh, with respect to the case in which HNGP2 is not there. So basically this is, a, although there's no direct interaction between HNGP2 and CTCF, there is an indirect interaction through, uh, or, uh, through SARM2 or a competition for SARM2 that is involved in the phase separation uh, propensity of CTCF. We also went forward and we observed also in this, in this simulation the, the increased co-localization of, of CTCF and, and, and SARM2. And also, another nice experiment that they did was to remove also SARM2 from the picture. And if you remove SARM2 from the picture, you lose the CTCF cluster. So this is clearly a SARM2 induced phase separation, let's, say, let's put it that way. And we also observed, uh, so observed this. So basically, it looks like the CTCF uh, needs HNGP2 to, to be away and uses SARM2 as a nucleation site, let's put it that way, for the, for the phase separation. But then the last thing I actually would like to, to tell you that it's more interesting, even more interesting for me, was that another experiment that they did was to um, increase uh, the bound fraction of CTCF on chromatin, the chromatin bound fraction of CTCF. They did so increasing the concentration of zinc ions into the, into the medium, and this actually increased the efficiency of uh, the zinc fingers of CTCF to bind to chromatin. So in this way, you can artificially increase the presence of CTCF. And what they observed in the data here, you can see that the, the, the number of cells showing clustering of CTCF decreases. And for, for one time, the model was not explaining that. So I'm showing you something that the model does, did not explain. The model ex actually was predicting the other way around by increasing the CTCF concentration, uh, sorry, bound, uh, chromatin bound concentration, we had more uh, clustering. While if uh, this was the case in which while CTCF was binding chromatin, by, by binding chromatin, CTCF was not changing its self-separation, self uh, let's say, propensity. But if actually we uh, tested another hypothesis in which the binding to chromatin changes the self-separation a bit of, uh, of, of CTCF, then you get the, 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 the reduction of clustering. So if, we put, if I put the average of this distribution in a, in, in a plot, you here have the bound fraction of CTCF, and on the, on the y-axis you have the the, 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 um, the cluster size fraction, then you see these two opposite behaviors. And then the delta E equals zero, that 
is the, one, the case in which it, the, the self uh, separation propensity of CTCF doesn't change, can be easily explained because CTCF, while it's bound to chromatin, from a Brownian motion exponent, uh, diffusion exposure to one, goes to a, a, a Rouse model roughly of 0 0.5. And you can see here in this other project in which we have simulations uh, and uh, we measure the anomalous diffusion coefficient, uh, and uh, we, uh, we observe that this goes even below 0.5, and it actually depends on the state of the chromatin you are looking at. So if, whether this is a gene, and as lower than this, this case in setting, which is a region that does not, have, does not have any gene, et cetera, et cetera. But the delta E different from zero was nicely uh, being explained by instead, um, um, you can explain it uh, uh, by, the, by making the hypothesis that your structure now is changing because of the, so if you, if you by, by attaching to, to, to protein bound to, to, to the chromatin, you change the cell separation ability, and you can do it in many ways, you can get this decrease of, of contacts uh, very easily because the, this, this is more energetic favorable than, than before. Uh, and what this was even more nice was that you can even think about a third category, but as many categories as you want, as face separated objects, in which uh, actually the, bind, the binding to chromatin is triggering the, the, say, the self separation of the, of the protein. That is the case of RNA BOR2, that uh, when it binds actually to promoters, to genes, it actually starts to recruit other protein. Uh, and to act like a hub and, uh, uh, let's say, a self-separated object. So that's all that I got. Uh, we believed, though, that uh, the bound fraction is an important, or protein is an important uh, parameter, so that also the, 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 the you know, chromatin is an important role in protein phase separation in the nucleus. Thank you. I want to thank you, all these collaborators, all, my, all the biologists that, uh, that work with me, Akis Pavantonis, uh, Marike, and, and Tom, and thank you very much. In the interest of time, we'll skip questions because we're running behind. Um, you can please approach him later on during lunch. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. How do you plan this on? All right, our final but not the, well, last but not the least speaker of the session is Ag Agnish Kumar Behera. Stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, first off, I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, wonderful meeting and also for accommodating me uh, on such short notice. Uh, I was supposed to give the talk tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. So uh, today I'll be talking about Hibbian unlearning and non-equilibrium activity. It's more related to neuroscience stuff, but yeah. So let's look at the basic uh, integrated and fire model of, model of neurons, uh, where you have like neurons, they have a certain connection between them. And the way these neurons store uh, memories is by uh, changing these, conne these connections. Uh, that's what we call the neurons to be plastic. Uh, the way the changes happen is uh, you have a, a presynaptic firing, uh, the signal travels, and then there's uh, a postsynaptic uh, spiking. In between this region of GIJ, uh, the connection, there's a certain integrator. Uh, there's a certain integrator which integrates the signal, and it can be of two forms. Li like uh, you can either have a very uh, simple uh, exponentially decaying uh, spike, or you can have something with, which has two different time scales. In this paper by uh, William Bialik and others, they have shown that if instead of having just one time scale, if you have two time scales, then uh, the kind of equations of motion that you get for this firing rate, y, are very similar to what one would get if you have like uh, self-propelled velocity in uh, active matter. And I'm not showing any of the equations. If you want the math, then please talk to me during the lunch. Uh, but we'll, uh, in order to simplify things, what we'll do is we'll work with a very simplified model of uh, associative memory, the Hopwell model, wherein uh, the neurons are uh, essentially Ising, Ising spins, plus minus ones. The way uh, one stores memory in, these, uh, in this, in this uh, Hopwell model is uh, uh, by uh, constructing uh, energy, free energy attractors, 
free energy minimal which are attractors for the memories. The way one goes about doing it is constructing the Hamiltonian in the following way where the connections are entirely dependent on the patterns that you want to store in your system. And this is given by the Hebbian rule where the neurons which uh, fire together wire together. Now, uh, the, in this uh, nice paper by Hoffield again, uh, he showed that uh, you can store more patterns by something which is called unlearning, as in you store uh, the patterns that you want to store, and then you try to forget the patterns that you do not want to store, the spurious minimas in your system. And uh, you go about doing it uh, by uh, raising the uh, energies of the, of the spurious minimas, in this case, uh, for instance, uh, this, this region. This is something that you don't want to store and you don't want the system to get attracted to, so you raise the energy of this thing in the following fashion. Uh, this requires explicit tuning of the GIGs, the connections. What we propose is instead of explicitly tuning the GIGs by hand, we could just change the dynamics of the neurons. As in, uh, previously all these dynamics are like uh, uh, these respect, uh, the detail balance. If you just break detail balance by introducing an active force in the system, and in our case, this active force is an exponentially uh, uh, correlated noise source. It's a colored noise source, which doesn't have a uh, corresponding friction coefficient, uh, friction kernel here. Then uh, the detail balance is violated, and you observe similar phenomena. Uh, the reason for this is, uh, if you look at the, uh, the distribution, the probability distribution sampled by uh, something like this uh, from uh, the uh, unlearning procedure, it's given, by, uh, it's given by the Boltzmann form with additional things, uh, constraints coming from uh, the unlearning procedure, which is 1 plus lambda square c. In the similar fashion, the, uh, the, the distribution of uh, spins, the configurations uh, which are sampled from this active uh, sampling procedure is given by uh, H effective divided by T effective. And it can be shown that in the limit of uh, very small driving, this H effective looks very similar to uh, the one which is obtained from uh, this unlearning procedure. Uh, this parameter lambda captures the extent of dreaming or the unlearning procedure that's happening in your system. And C essentially captures the correlation between patterns. Uh, so uh, this thing is, uh, it's all analytical. So, and it's all happening in the limit of very small driving. But say we want a, a procedure to understand what, what's happening when the driving is a lot. There's no analytical procedure for that. And saying that this is exactly equivalent to that would, wouldn't be the right thing. So what we did is we said, well, we'll generate samples from uh, both the passive, uh, uh, passive dynamics and active dynamics. And we'll infer this lambda parameter for both of them. Doing that is agnostic to whatever we have been doing earlier. It's completely data driven. And the way we do, go about doing it is, is the following. You just generate configurations using the Hamiltonian, using either passive dynamics or active dynamics. Then you feed it to a three layer RBM. And this three layer RBM with uh, the data being fed in this lower, lowermost layer, sigma, and these two hidden layers, uh, the, the Z is a continuous hidden layer and uh, phi is also continuous. But if you, if you have something like this, this uh, we can mathematically show that this is exactly equivalent to sampling from this distribution. So once we do that, we can infer lambda using uh, uh, something called, uh, uh, by, uh, by uh, trying to reduce the KL divergence of the system. And if we do that, we finally obtain uh, this, the fact that for the passive case, the lambda goes close to zero, which is exactly what we want. And for the active case, uh, for, for the dreaming case, lambda is greater than zero. And this is also exactly what we obtain for uh, the active case, which is uh, greater lambda, uh, lambda greater than zero, which uh, goes on to prove our claim that uh, with active dynamics, the system is performing something uh, like dreaming. Uh, yeah, so the summary of results is uh, uh, the neurons store information, as I, as I mentioned, by modifying the synaptic connectivity. And our method provides a way to modify the connectivity without explicit intervention. So all we are doing is just changing the form of dynamics, no explicit uh, cutting or uh, changing the connections. 
And another good thing is that the modification is not permanent. As in, as soon as we remove this uh, activity from the system, uh, the modifications go away as well. We get back the original system. Yeah. Thank you, and I would like to thank my PI, Suri, and um, my group members. Questions? Thank you so much. Um, we have time for one quick question, if anybody has one. Yes, please. Uh, could you please uh, repeat the question loudly? The value of lambda that you get doesn't depend on No, it, it doesn't depend on that. The value of lambda that we get, it uh, actually depends on the amount of driving that we put into the system, as in uh, the amount of activity. So there's a certain way we put activity in this discrete system, because uh, this correlated noise source that I mentioned it can only be done for like a continuous system. But uh, it has a very specific form, as in uh, if you have a kick in one direction, it'll keep you kicking in the same direction for a certain while before turning the direction, like a run and tumble motion. So for active case, what we do is we uh, follow flips by flips, or like if it's not flipping, it'll stay in the same configuration for the spin. And we have a parameter for that, and if we ramp it up, the uh, value of lambda also goes up. I mean, we can discuss that. All right, let's thank Agnish for the presentation. Um, and it's lunchtime. <laughs>